Rise. As we gather together in God's house this morning, we pray that His love would fill our hearts, that His love would guide our lives, that His love would give us peace. Now and always, for Jesus' sake, amen. The Word of God that we consider today from the book of Exodus, the 34th chapter, verses 29 to 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went back to speak with the Lord. Please be seated. I don't know if you caught it or not, but during this Epiphany season, and Epiphany runs from the end of the Christmas season to the beginning of Lent, which starts Wednesday. During this Epiphany season, the overall theme for our worship service has been the making of ministry. And I just wonder, what's your first reaction? The making of ministry. It's easy for us to think, well, that doesn't apply to me. Because when we think of ministry, we think of what? We think of our called teachers and we think of our called pastors. But the word ministry simply means to serve. And that's what God wants all of us to do. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to serve one another. He wants us to serve the people of this world. But when we hear that, it's kind of easy for us to, to pull a Moses Lord, who am I? It's easy for us to pull a Jeremiah, as we heard a few weeks ago, and say, I'm only a child. Or maybe we truly are so humble that we say, Lord, I can't serve you, and we run and hide like King Saul did. Or maybe the reality of our self leads us to become so guilt-ridden like Peter that we tell our Lord, Lord, Go away from me, for I am a sinner. And our Lord would say, no. I called you to be my child. And connected to that call is also the call to serve, to be a minister. So that we can serve effectively, God gives us <coughs> unparalleled power. And in these verses, what we see are two things about that unparalleled power. First of all, the source of that unparalleled power, and then the confidence that that power gives to us. Unparalleled power was something really that, that Moses needed to serve God. And, and maybe we don't think of that initially. Maybe, maybe our impression of Moses is like a Rambo-type guy or a Captain America who just runs out there, takes charge, is strong, powerful, and saying, let's go! But Moses wasn't like that. When God called Moses to lead, Moses made excuse after excuse after excuse. And so God finally led Moses to accept that call to serve, and then he gave him unparalleled power. Just listen to this. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, that's the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. This was the second time Moses had been up on Mount Sinai to get those two tables of stone containing the Ten Commandments. Remember what happened the first time? Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and he hears it. The sound of 
sin. Sexual immorality abounds. He comes down from the mountain. Ah, there it is. He saw it. The golden calf. And Moses was so upset with the spiritual fickleness of his people, God's people, that he took those two stone tablets and he threw them to the ground and smashed them. God said, Moses, come back. So Moses goes back up Mount Sinai, there for 40 days. Can you imagine that? Just God and Moses for 40 days. What an absolute thrill for Moses to be up on that mountain with God. Do you remember what we read when he came down from that mountain? Remember about his face? It was radiant. It was reflecting the glory of God. And when Moses came down and the people saw that when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses' face was radiant, they were afraid to come near him. Understandable. But then Moses, we're told, called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Moses' face was radiant. What did that tell the people? That Moses wasn't up there on Mount Sinai all by himself, chiseling out those Ten Commandments. He wasn't up there all by himself trying to figure out how he was going to get this godless group of people to fall in line and obey. That radiant face told the people, God, Moses was up there with God. And what Moses gave to the people, those two stone tablets, those were not the figments of his imagination. Those were the very commands of God. That was the source of Moses' unparalleled power. He probably wasn't some brainiac who was trying to figure out some way to get control over this group of people. He probably wasn't this charismatic speaker who was going to figure out some way to corral this group of people. He wasn't some power-hungry maniac that simply wanted these people to fall in line and do what he wanted them to do. His radiant face said what? I have been with God. And what I am sharing with you is not something that I dreamed up on that mountain. But what I am sharing with you is the very command of God. Right now, you and I are just like Moses. We're in the presence of God. Not because we're in this building, but because we're listening to God's Word. And through this Word, God reveals Himself to us. Now, I don't think when we leave after being in the presence of God and you think of the Lord's Supper as well, I don't think that when we leave, our faces are going to be radiant. But Lord willing, our hearts and our lives will be. And they will reflect God's love as we go out into the world. That we will be willing to serve the people that God places into our life. may ask what do you think about that to go out into the world and serve specifically as, as Moses did here to go out into the world and serve the people by speaking the word of God do you feel like Moses I don't know how to speak do you feel like Jeremiah? I'm only a child. Maybe when we think about that call of our God to serve Him, we feel very inadequate. We feel very weak and very worthless. And so God supplies us with the power that we need. 
What did he tell Jeremiah as we heard a few weeks ago when Jeremiah said, Lord, I'm only a child. God said what? See, now I have put my word in your mouth. And he told Isaiah basically the same thing. And here with Moses, what does he do? He gives him the Ten Commandments, the very word, command, and will of God. And what has he done for us? He says, you go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then doing what? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You and I may not be eloquent. You and I may have never taken a class that teaches us how to influence people and make friends. But God has plopped something into our hearts and our hands that is so powerful. He has given us His Word. And he does not ask us necessarily to explain that word. He doesn't tell, he tells us not to embellish that word. He doesn't tell us use this word to win people. He doesn't tell us use this word to convert people. All he says is what? Speak it. That's all he wants us to do. And when we are afraid, when we're nervous, when we don't feel capable, just remember the unparalleled power that he has supplied to us. He has given us the words that he simply wants us to speak. And that source of power, the word of God, is what makes us confident to speak. I mean, just stop to think about Moses. I mean, Moses was a guy that made excuse after excuse after excuse. God got so fed up with him after a while, but now all of a sudden, what do you see Moses doing? Ministering, serving, speaking. And the source of that confidence, this is what we're told. But whenever he, Moses, entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what he had been commanded. They saw that his face was radiant. I, I think that there were two things that here give Moses confidence. Number one, his face is radiant. And people saw that and they recognized again what? Moses has been with God. And when Moses comes to us, he is coming to us on God's behalf. The other thing that gave him confidence, what was Moses talking? What was he saying? Not something that he was dreaming up or making up, but he was simply speaking the very words that God had given to him. Now, which one of those two, the radiant face or the word of God, do you suppose gave him the most confidence? And before you answer that, I'm helping you here. Before you answer that, just realize that in time, that radiancy for Moses' face was gone. See, you know what gave him confidence? To minister? It was the Word. It was the Word of God that God gave to him. And that's what supplies us with confidence to simply speak God's Word. I mean, think of Jesus. You know what they said about Jesus when he was, when he was on earth? They said he spoke as one who had authority. What gave Jesus authority? Do you suppose Jesus was, a, was the most excellent speaker ever? I can imagine Jesus would have been just enthralling to listen to. But what made him speak with authority wasn't the way that he presented the word. It's simply that he spoke God's word. He wasn't speaking man's word, which everybody else was speaking. He spoke something authoritative, and that was the word of God. That's what gave Jesus basically confidence to speak. Or how about the Apostle Paul? Do you, would, you, would, would you like to have the gifts of the Apostle Paul and be able to speak like the Apostle Paul and answer questions like the Apostle Paul? But you know what was said of the Apostle Paul one time? This is what is written about the Apostle Paul. In person, he is unimpressive. 
And remember he had that thorn in the flesh? Three times he prayed to God to take that thorn in the flesh away, and God said, what? No, you're going to live with that thorn in the flesh. Now get out there and be my minister. And he did. And he was effective. Why? He wasn't impressive. He had a thorn in the flesh that hindered him, but he spoke what? The word of God. That's what gave him confidence, and that's what made him effective. And God has given the same thing to us. You guys, we need to understand, it's not the messenger. It's not the messenger, it's the message. And yet, and it, you and I will pull a Moses or a Jeremiah and say, Lord, who am I? Lord, I'm only a child. Lord, I don't know how to speak. And then, then, we, then we throw down the ace. Bam! And you know what the ace in the hole is? I'm a sinner. How can I, a sinner, a known sinner, how is anybody going to ever listen to me when I try and talk to them about Jesus? I'm a bad person, God. And it's not just that we... We sin on occasion. We sin continually. And it's not just that, that every once in a while we kind of stumble or trip or <laughs> accidentally sin. Can we be honest with each other right now? Lord willing, we've been honest the whole time. But, but, but how, many, how many times don't we carefully plan the sin that we're going to commit. And after we commit it, what do we do? We work as hard as we can to hide it. And God says what? I see it. And one of the purposeful sins that he sees us commit in our life perhaps on more than one occasion, is when God opens the door right before us, puts somebody right there in front of us who desperately wants to hear the Word of God, and we say nothing. And we sin. And I think all of us are aware of not the consequence, but the punishment of sin. Hell. You know, we talk about hell as an, a prison, a place of eternal torture, and, and I, don't, I don't think that really registers with us what that must be like. So, so think about this. I'm sure some of you get migraine headaches. My guess is that some of us this season have had that stomach flu or that influenza A, and we have felt like yuck. Hell is having that feeling forever. Hell is a place where nothing ever goes right. Where you are always frustrated and angry. And yet, we're not overcome with guilt. We're not frozen in fear. We're not pessimistic people. Why not? Because we truly understand from the power of God's Word what's happened to all of our sins. The planned ones, the unplanned ones, the ones we readily confess, the ones we try and cover up, all of them are gone. And by God's grace, we understand why they're gone. Because of Jesus. Because Jesus lived a perfect life and, and veiled all of our sins with his perfection. Because Jesus went to that cross, bam, 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 all over in his body and suffered the curse for all of our sins because Jesus willingly laid down his life for us and with that offered the ransom that God demanded. Jesus did that for us. And as a result of what Jesus did for us, as revealed in this, you and I get to go to heaven. Where we won't live through weather like this ever again. Unless you love it, that can be your heaven, if you want it to be your heaven. 
but we'll be in heaven. Endless, uninterrupted joy. To be like Moses on the top of Mount Sinai and just being there with God. That's what heaven is. Perfect, endless, unbroken blessings and love and the presence of our God. That's what we look forward to. And the reason why that change in our life, it wasn't because some charismatic speaker talked us into it. It wasn't because some praise man moved us to it. It wasn't because some wonderful PowerPoint impressed us. Not that there's anything wrong with that stuff, and that stuff can enhance. But it's not the way it's presented, it's what's presented. It's the Word. And if it's a charismatic speaker, praise God. If it's a fantastic praise man, praise God. If it's good looking stuff up there, praise God. But it's not the presentation, it's what's presented. It's the Word of God. That's the power. It's the Word of God that called everything into existence out of what? Nothing. It's the Word of God that calmed a raging storm in an instant. It's the Word of God that sent the devil and death running. It's the Word of God that convicted us of our sin and convinced us that Jesus Christ is my Savior. That's the power. That's what gives us confidence. Here was my attempt at humor. You know, maybe we don't speak good. Tee hee, tee hee, that's pro improper grammar. Maybe we don't speak well. Maybe we do get nervous. Maybe we are afraid. Maybe we're afraid somebody's going to ask me a question about what God has said and I am not going to know the answer. And so God plops this person right into our life and they are searching and yearning and desiring to know a saving truth. And we say nothing. Say something. Speak the Word of God. It's the source of unparalleled power. It's what gave confidence to Moses. It worked for Jeremiah. It worked for the Apostle Paul. We could say it worked for Jesus. It will work for you. When God gives you the opportunity to minister to someone, by simply speaking his word. A message of peace, of joy, of hope, of comfort, of confidence, of love, and eternal life in heaven with Jesus. Amen. Please rise. And now